Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are again, another session of Air Freight Pharma, which is the essential transport for an essential industry topic of our digital event. Here we are now, we've got three fantastic guests and I'd just like to introduce them quickly and then I'll embarrass them after the quick introduction by going through a bit of their bios. So firstly, we've got Chiara Venuti, who's the Business Development Director, Strategic Account Management of SkyCell. We then have, um, welcome, welcome Chiara, lovely to see Thank you again, you. lovely to see you again. Then we've got Miguel Rodriguez, who's the Senior Manager, Climate Controlled Products for Qatar Airways, lovely to see you again, Miguel. Same ways. And lastly, but by no means least, we've got Fabrizio Iacobacci, Head of Pharma Business Development, B Cube Air Cargo. So lovely to have you on board, guys. Really, really appreciate you joining us. And um, hopefully you. we're going to have an interesting session this morning. Now, I'm just going to, like I said earlier, a little bit of embarrassment. So when the family and the kids or the relatives hear these things they might not know about you, they'll be suitably impressed. So firstly, Chiara, currently holding the position of Business Development Director, Strategic Account Management, and one of the leading pharma air freight container providers. 15 years track record of successful experience in the logistics and healthcare supply chain industry. And Chiara is an acknowledged specialist in implementing end-to-end -end supply chain solutions for global vaccine businesses. Chiara, great shout, great shout, eh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Now we move on to Miguel. And Miguel is Senior Manager of Climate Control Products for Qatar Airways. Strong background in operations of commercial management in the aviation and hospitality industries, working with companies such as Etihad Airways and Hilton Hotels. He joined Qatar Airways in December 2019 and is currently responsible for the climate control products, operational and commercial development, which includes QR Pharma, QR Fresh, which is the perishable uh, vertical, and QR Live, Live Animals. He was responsible for the IR to CIV, CEIV Pharma and Fresh certification in his previous company and has led the IR to CEIV Pharma certification for Qatar Airways. And based in Doha, of which I know very well, Miguel. So we've uh, been in absolutely been in quite, quite quite a nice spot in the Gulf, yeah. Yes, it is indeed. Yeah, yeah. And and then we come, then we come to um, Fabrizio Iacobacci, who's the head of farm business development, B Cube Air Cargo. And Fabrizio has been working in the aviation industry since 1998. Experience ranges from passenger and cargo handling activities to legal compliance and business development. Also extended his competence in temperature control cargo since 2010 when he joined BQ Air Cargo. As in his role of head of pharma, developer Fabrizio is the project leader for the specialization of BQ Air Cargo in pharmaceutical logistics and cool chain solutions. And he managed the IR to CIV pharma certification program uh, at, um, at both locations, making B-Cube Air Cargo one of the first independent handlers in the world to be certified and the first in Italy and in Southern Europe. So well done, guys. Right, we've got a very experienced group here with us. And to kick us off, I'm just going to hand over to Chiara, who's going to give a little bit of an intro as to what we're all doing and um, how and why. So Chiara, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I simply just would like to tell uh, you and our audience uh, the case study that we're going to present to you today. I mean, it's a case study, it's a shipment that it actually happened with the partners we have on the panel today. Uh, so it's a, a pharmaceutical company headquartered in Italy. Um, they uh, produce a compassionate drug for rare di di disease. So this uh, uh, drug needs to be transported in to minus temperature. Just for you uh, to understand the work we've done, this uh, product uh, um, as a critical point of minus 20 Celsius. So if the product goes above minus 20 Celsius, like a minus 19 Celsius, then the product is uh, done and needs to be disposed. Uh, we are in the world of rare disease for which, as you know, Chris, the production is not, you know, mass production as maybe some other pharmaceutical product for which in, those are really the case where there is no room for mistakes in the supply chain. Something goes wrong, needs to be produced again, and they takes a long time. It's not that on the shelf there's going to be the next pallet ready to be sent out. 
So this drug was then sent directly to an hospital in, in Chicago. So it was going a, basically a direct to patient, almost a delivery. Uh, we had to deal with this uh, a strict minus 20 temperature for which together with the quality team of the pharmaceutical company, the decision was taken to deploy our the sky cell container deep frozen because the extreme minus temperature don't harm the product. So the, you know, the, the critical point was the above minus 20. They uh, previously used alternative packaging uh, providers for this shipment and they face a temperature excursion. That's why in this occasion, they came to SkyCell. This company already uses us for other temperature ranges. So they know our performance. And that's what we are today, Chris. We would like to share with you the work we have done together to protect this important cargo and make sure it was arriving in top condition to the patients. Yep, I think that's fantastic. One of the things, one of the things I've had the privilege of, of experiencing is, is going to see some of the some of the organizations that distribute, produce, they do the various testing, etc. And I was so impressed with one particular company um, because every single person in that organization they knew exactly what the particular drugs were for. And it was intentional because the company also on the label of the, of the medical name or the reference name, what, the, what, the medical, what that particular uh, medication was for. And as a result of that, every single person I spoke to, and there was 29 different nationalities working there, they all spoke with such a passion uh, because they knew either a family member, a friend or somebody, and they knew exactly what they were doing. And they were providing hope. And when I speak with people, and like you just covered there, Kiara, and, and the three of you, it's that hope and it's that care that shines through. And that's what's made everybody sit up and listen and, and, and view now supply chain in a totally different manner. So if I was there with you, I would applaud you and I would say well done to everybody. But genuinely, seriously, it's an absolutely excellent, excellent role that you all play in something that people take for granted and don't realize how important it is. So well done. So and now, then, if you would like to start the story, Chiara. Sorry, Chris, sorry. just to add one more thing, that's why we decided to take this occasion as well to talk about the work we have done together is because there is a lot being said about logistic of minus temperature and us together, we really want to show to you how we executed and my successfully a minus a temperature shipment because it is possible, it is not easy, but it's also important for us to share with the audience how we did it so that others can, of course, learn. Uh -huh. and yep, 100%. And one of the questions that I will be asking is, and, and we've mentioned CIV, we mentioned about the asset investment that companies had to make in, in pharma facilities, and it's a huge cost. But one of the things that I always ask people now is as the awareness is there from the from the um, from the production point all the way through from the shipper there there's a there's a responsibility that the actual packaging is capable of going all the way through that process. That's now a balance of whether or not things should be done faster and quicker and how much necessity there is for these large facilities or whether the facilities should be central at each airport. So those are, those are a couple of points I'll bring up. But over to you now, Kiara, if you can start us on the journey. Um, so, I mean, the first thing we have done together, of course, I mean, we had uh, a lot of, let's call it tripartite calls to really understand the needs, uh, to understand the product was really going through a risk-based analysis. Yeah. So we yeah. had to look at what was in front of us uh, and understand uh, where there were potential risks and how to, to mitigate them. Um, so uh, at SkyCell, of course, uh, we always, we have our own, let's say, lane risk assessment tool is a simulator. So we really came together uh, to uh, simulate the shipment, to understand the performance of the container and to uh, really also evaluate when and where a, a re-icing would have been needed. Of course, was the deep frozen container of SkyCell. So the deep frozen is the only series of SkyCell container that operates with dry ice. So 
Um, I don't know if I can then pass on as well to, to maybe Miguel to have an analysis of the, the, the risk that they were uh, as well on the journey on uh, when it came to the air freight movement. Uh, uh, we can probably start from, from that point, yeah. Yep, okay, Miguel. Yep, no, absolutely, and and uh, and I fully endorse uh, Chiara's words, uh, and and I think this this is a, an example of uh, what we discuss in several forums about collaboration and uh, transparency and sharing information. Uh, I, I think that was put in practice here in this project since the very beginning, um, when we were contacted by by Skycell and by the forwarder with uh, my colleagues in Italy as well. Um, it was clear that it was a very. Uh, this was a very one of those projects that you are proud to to work on and deliver, and uh, and as well we use our our uh, lane uh, lane risk assessment uh, tool as as you may know uh, we use Validate for that, and um, we put into consideration all the factors uh, with our uh, ground handling partners at Origin with uh, Fabrizio here in the call as well. Um, to make sure that we have the right uh, capabilities there and uh, how long that container is going to be uh, before loading into the flight. Um, we analyze uh, what's the weather conditions, we analyze uh, the duration of the flight, the, the temperature settings in flight. Um, we, it's, it's good that we have a direct uh, service between, uh, between the two destinations that were involved here, between Milan and Chicago. So uh, we avoid uh, the transit point, which is, uh, which is uh, always good in a, in a pharma shipment and especially in, uh, of this kind. And as well, there was intense cooperation or, um, or information sharing with our uh, partners at uh, the other side at Chicago and with the consignee as well to make sure that everything was, uh, was going to go as planned, right? So, um, so yeah, indeed, um, thorough lane risk assessment, I think is critical for, for uh, this kind of, uh, of shipment. And uh, the coordination and information sharing between the different touch points, uh, it's, uh, it has been critical for the success. Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. And, uh, and obviously for Fabrizio, important uh, that you get your part right there, huh? Yes, of course, thanks a lot. Uh, just to add uh, another consideration to what already Miguel and Chiara said, um, the main point is exactly the, the assessment of risks. I mean, not, nothing really strange on, on, on what we do every day in our life from the operational point of view. But what I want to specify, what I want to stress now is the point that the mitigation, the risk is an opportunity in this sense. What we, what, 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 we, what, what we need to think about is the fact that when you think about risk assessment, you cannot say that you have your CIV or certification hang on the wall, being sure that you, have, you are perfectly compliant 100% with whatever will be the operational flow you have to deal with. The point is that really you have to make an extra gap analysis. And every time you do that, in every negative occurrence you live in your operational life, in this case, of course, I am an energy agent. So in that case, every time you do that, you improve your, the level uh, of your uh, backup capacity. So that's the point. So the more you perform the risk assessment on every situation you live, the more you reduce the risks, the real risk. You cannot solve the risk, of course, but you cannot be afraid of the risk, but be confident you can solve it. And only studying, let's say, only making some more analysis. It is exactly what we have done. Nothing really strange. Simply we made a next extra gap analysis, trying to understand, for example, from the point of view of the backup for the extra dry ice and back to the point of the supplier management. So really very, very easy things, but uh, done in the right way. So risk is an opportunity in this sense. I love that. Risk is an opportunity. And um, what, what you've highlighted there, and you're saying it's easy and it's something that's done regular. I think this, this pandemic has taught people the importance of risk, of, of worst case scenario simulation, of having everybody understand where things can go wrong. Not that they're expecting it to go wrong, but they're very, very, very aware and capable and agile when something does happen that they know exactly what to do. And, and I think that's one of the things that's impressed um, everybody globally. Now, with regard to that, with regard to that backup contingency, and, and because there's so many of you in that, in that chain, who, who takes the overall coordination? Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. So, so actually, start, start, at this the point, start the game. Start the game with the circle. Start the game with the at circle. This, exactly. <laughs> at this point, Chris, I mean, I do like to talk, but I do like to see data. So if it's okay with you, I just wanted to share uh, with you and with our audience uh, the yep. lane risk assessment. So we talk, we analyze the gap, uh, and we came up with a piece of document. It's a lane risk assessment that is also somehow, Chris, an instructions that we are passing on to the chain of that's what we are expecting, that's how we will perform. If anything is deviating, please let us know, we will reassess. So I will hopefully do a, a good screen share. So can you see my screen now? We can indeed, yep, yep, oh. lovely. Perfect. Okay. Okay, perfect. So that's exactly what we've done. So we have for you guys to know in minus 20, we have the dotted red line. So that is the temperature, the product was not uh, supporting above that. So we must stay below minus 20. In the blue line is the uh, internal temperature of the container. Here in this pink line, you see the external temperature that we expected. Yeah. during the journey and uh, the green line represented let's call it the energy that is stored inside the container right so okay. uh, the instruction was okay at sky cell we with all our container we hand over the container at the loading point there are qc pass ready to load so the um, setup and preconditioning of the container is done in our service center the container travels to the customer so arrives and it's here, the container, it's loaded at the customer premises. So the temperature uh, is loaded into, it was a minus 15 fridge. So this is the external temperature. Then the container travels. I mean, the loading point was in the south of Italy. So there was a bit of a journey to travel back up to Milan Malpensa. Now we are talking, we are dealing with minus temperature products, Chris. Yeah, we yeah. had to come up with the instruction, let's say special instructions, they were dedicated for this SOP. So we needed to ask to the chain, so to Miguel and Fabrizio, to store the container upon arrival in Malpensa Airport into the minus 20 fridge. We were very lucky. Malpensa, Fabrizio and Bicuba has a minus 20 uh, chamber that can accommodate the container. In uh, that occasion as well, the re-icing was performed. So again, the re-icing was performed also by request of the pharma shipper. They really didn't want to take any risk, Chris. So they, re they asked us to re-ice before the container was flying, just to make sure it was fully yeah, charged. Yeah. Important note for you to know, the re-icing of the sky cell container takes 100 kilo of dry ice. That as an industry, it's a very low amount of dry ice. And then maybe Miguel can, with this knowledge and expertise, tell us more of what does it mean when it goes onto an aircraft, 100 kilo of dry ice. Correct, correct. And especially with the new, the new limitations, yeah. Correct. And then here you have the flight. So we said we're flying from Alpensa to, to Chicago. You had the two tarmacs. We really took, I mean, in the simulation, this actually was the smallest part of the flight, but the worst case scenario, we imagine, let's say overall, more or less the temperature will be, you know, at 15 degrees time, it's loaded, the, 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 the plane is closed, but this is Miguel to tell us. And then arrival in Chicago, in this case, the airport, the ground handling in Chicago, Chicago didn't have a minus 20 room. So the container was stored into the 228 chamber until then it went on to delivery, a final destination. Okay, so very now, good. Now, so what we're looking at there is we're looking at the total, total point to point of just over 10 days, correct? Correct, correct. Okay, right, very good. Yes. Now, now, yeah, if I may, uh, just a couple of comments uh, regarding the dry ice. Um, so, so yes, indeed, um, the, the dry ice is, is a consideration for, for any shipment uh, yep. uh, inside an aircraft belly. Uh, as you know, it sublimates and creates uh, CO2 that is not, uh, is not great for the, for the crews that will be on the, on the flight and there are certain restrictions and limitations on, on the quantities. Um, the good thing is that the amount of dry ice that this uh, shipment required is, is quite minimal. 100 kilos is not, uh, is not a, a massive uh, amount of dry ice. 
and it can be uh, compatible as well with uh, with other shipments that would carry as well dry ice and add up to the limits on the on the aircrafts. And uh, and I believe you briefly touched on that, uh, Chris. Thanks, if we can say that. Thanks to the COVID nineteen vaccines, uh, those dry ice uh, limitations were were uh, substantially increased. Uh, at least in our case, and I know that other 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 carriers as well managed to to increase those limits. Um, so we can say that today, as as opposed to one or two years ago, uh, we can carry uh, a lot more uh, dry ice in our bellies or or our freighters than than we could uh, before the pandemic. So this is one of the positive outcomes that we can take out of the out of the crisis that uh, we are able to ship more uh, dry ice uh, on board. And, uh, and as well to note that, uh, of course, uh, in the simulation, it was taking the worst case scenario. Um, we set the temperature of the, of the flight at uh, five degrees for the, for the journey. And uh, definitely um, it wouldn't be the graph uh, with, with this shape in the, in, the real, uh, in the real shipment that happened. Um, but for the study and for the, for the worst case scenario and risk mitigation, uh, this was a quite good approach. Um, yeah. Because anyway, um, that would be uh, even if there would be a failure in the temperature uh, hold, um, temperature control capability, that would be about the right temperature that that shipment would have been exposed to in flight. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to make those um, yeah. those couple of comments. Also, I mean, last but not least, sorry to extend uh, a little bit. Uh, upon arrival, yes, indeed, the the GHA didn't have the, the freezer uh, capability. Um, however, and maybe we will discuss this more extens later, um, via close coordination and communication between our my colleagues there in Chicago and the consignee, uh, that shipment was, was brought to the, uh, to the consignee's uh, facilities and stored under uh, freezing conditions. So uh, uh, that was one of the mitigations that we, were, that we could work on, um, knowing already that the facilities were not available at uh, destination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Right. Now, can I ask? Um, can I just ask a quick question there? Right. So this was this this was the worst case scenario lane risk assessment. Okay. Now, when it actually was was done and you had the proper tracking, do you overlay the actual over the worst case scenario so that in future the worst case scenario isn't as isn't as severe? The point is, uh, Chris, when we do a lane risk assessment, we normally always uh, take uh, a worst case scenario because uh, we want to be uh, always protected. Uh, so yes, of course, the, the, the flight was, uh, um, I mean, the tarmac condition more or less they were spot on because I mean, that is like going into the weather network and take the data was there. Um, the, the, the flight was indeed a lower temperature, but we know that what we like to know is if it, it's better, we just have a better performance of the container, so. Okay, very good. And and, and now just a question that I, I, I've got to ask. I'm sorry to ask, even though I probably know the answer myself, but I still have to ask you all. If you look at it and the criticality of this particular shipment and anybody that's traveled themselves, they know the length of a flight time from, from, from Italy to the US. They would be saying now 10 days, that's a long time, huh? It is a very long time, Chris, indeed. I mean, as I told you, uh, we had, uh, so the container traveled to the south of Italy, where the manufacturer was. So we had a, long, uh, a longer journey uh, to reach Milan airport. Um, and then, of course, I mean, the, the flight was the easiest part because then he arrived, as I told you before, we're talking about a drug for rare disease. Yeah, yeah. That if anybody's experienced that flex, something that is called FDA. So upon arrival in, in Chicago, unfortunately, could not go straight into door delivery because the FDA requested to do some checks on the product. So yeah. this is then exactly, Chris, the reality of those shipments. Anybody would say, come on, from Malpensa to Chicago in three days, you should execute this shipment. Yeah. Yes, but it came from the very south of Italy and it was a drug for rare disease. So the FDA put in hold, so we had to wait for it to be released. So indeed, it did take uh, uh, all this time to, to, to be delivered. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, to be honest, from, from, from container loading at the shipper uh, until arrival into Chicago, we are looking at three, four days max. 
yeah. right? So, so that that transit time is there uh, about three days, which is about uh, which is about right. Um, and then, as as uh, Kiana rightly mentioned, there was an FDA hold that we need to deal with. Um, but I mean, that didn't um, uh, impede that uh, we could uh, take the the container to the consignee's facilities for. Um, and wait for that uh, FDA okay to release the, the goods. So, um, so yeah, indeed, the, the performance of the container which, uh, was much better than, than the graph that we see uh, in front of us. Yeah, okay, yeah. lovely. And yes, Chris, Chris, sorry, but just together with two main other points. First is the infrastructures, you said before, I was, I was writing uh, during colleagues' talk about, and second, uh, not only infrastructures, facilities, but infrastructure, uh, continue to say, this point, this is very important because anyway, today we know that the, 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 the supply chain for pharmaceutical logistics by air is a, maybe we could say is a more fragmented than some other logistics chains. Now you know you know it very well, and in the sense you cannot really perform any risk assessment if you don't trust each other, if you don't really rely on right partners. And uh, this is something obvious. And, and when, when, you, when you hear to Chiara and Miguel describing the situation we live, in the end, it's something that seems easy, but you can imagine how many steps have been performed before. And without infrastructure, so without facilities, uh, you cannot really do that. If we didn't have the uh, minus 20 chamber in, in step A, it was uh, more complicated than uh, uh, in other situation. And second, if we didn't have is the right instructions. Chiara said the instructions. Instructions mean the SOP. An SOP means that we are talking all the same language uh, about the case. So this is the this is the main point. Today, technology help us. So the fragmented chain can be managed, of course, because technology can help us, but we need the right tools. Okay, the equipment is there. We need the facilities, but we need the instruction. And behind the instruction, we need to have the same culture of the product and of the products or the, of the process. Otherwise, you cannot reach this kind of result. Independently from BQ, Qatar, or Skyser, I'm a, this is a general perspective. Yeah, no, no, fully appreciate. I think one, one area or, or room for, for improvement for us all is with today's focus now on digitization and data sharing, yes. The checks that the FDA had to do is whether or not they could have done they could have done those at the beginning with sharing of information. Right. So there's fast tracking because you know it, it seems crazy that you know you you've got the capabilities for the actual movement, and then there's a hold because of administration yeah. or cross checking, etc. Absolutely yes. If I can if I can just uh, report an example, and then Chiara and then Miguel will continue. Um, I would say that the, the pharmaceutical logistics by air is really like the human body. You now we are all the, the right elements in the right moment must be there to have an organic movement of the system. And this is exactly what we leave there. Uh, and uh, it is the same when you, you do with the human body. And the main parameter you measure is the temperature. You know, with the COVID-19, the first thing you do is to you know is you, if you are 37.5 or not. So in the data sharing for pharmaceutical, we have one parameter, an elementary fundamental one that is temperature and temperature must be there in real time. It must yeah. be monitored and must be available in real time. This is the main element of the data sharing. And to get to the point, to the case study we lived, uh, believe me, just in five minutes with a normal iPhone, I mean, a cell phone, not an iPhone, with a normal cell phone link in three minutes with the, Sky cell server, we had immediately, together with Qatar, with Qatar the condition, the, the real time temperature condition of the shipment. That's the way we can talk about data sharing. Very easy, technology is there. In some cases, the data sharing is not a question of technology, it's a question of some other constraints related to the markets. But this is another story and will be another show, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but no, the, more, the more we all realize, you know, that together we're a lot stronger. And start sharing the information. That's that's the most important thing, which is which is there and which is coming. Um, now, another thing that I'd like to ask you is, and we're talking now about middle level, middle level filtering off or people leaving our industry. And over the last you know 12 to 18 months, we've seen lots of experience go. We've seen lots of people choose a different industry now. We've seen lots of lots of talent drain. Now, from my experience, most people. They get involved in either a you know a cool chain team or or a specialist team. 
they, they love what they do with an incredible passion. They love it. And, um, and then others look on them as either having an extra chance or an opportunity. Now, how do you keep everybody who's got any influence whatsoever as an enabler and not just the people that are focused on it? So having that expertise, that's a challenge in itself through all of your organizations, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If I may go, um, in our case, it's, it's a matter of, um, of uh, education in the sense of uh, training and awareness. Uh, and it's, it's about um, letting the, the, the colleagues and different, uh, not only the, the commercial or operational uh, uh, colleagues, but everyone in the organization realize how important it is to, to, be, uh, to be good at what we do and to, and to realize the importance of the shipments that we transport. It's not just uh, boxes that go from A to B, it's, it's, it's actual product that is saving lives. And that uh, in, in, the, in the case that we are talking today, or our um, vaccines that are going to put an end to, to this pandemic that uh, we are all suffering and we are all desperate to go back to our normal life to hug and kiss everyone. So um, the moment that everyone starts feeling the, that their contribution or, or their part uh, in, in, the, in the supply chain is making an impact to this, uh, to, to, to solve uh, part of the, you know, today's society problems, uh, that's where you get more, more engagement and more, um, let's say, enthusiasm in, in order to, um, uh, to come to work every day, right? Um, yeah. You know that you're having an impact in, in people's life. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the key elements that, uh, at least in my case, that keeps me uh, motivated. I know, 100%. And, and, and more PR, the better. So let people know exactly what goes on behind it. Uh, because when they realize, you know, it's, it's such an important, important element. And, and something that you see on, I mean, even IATA published some figures, I think in 2019, that stated that on, on air freight, that there was a 20%, a 20% excursion, temperature excursion record, which makes people think, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. And to a degree, that number is far too high. So when people choose from the very beginning, I think there's also a need now for an additional level of responsibility to choose the whole contact points upstream so what you guys are talking about there about having a solid a solid open chain and where you support each other like a relay team I think that's so more so much more important now than ever before so whoever makes the decisions on who the partners are they need to know that they've got the capability the ability the coordination the collaboration otherwise there is a much much higher risk uh, Chris, if I may add, you are completely right. I mean, my opinion is that it's not only a question of uh, back again to the CAV or whatever is the name of the certification. You cannot say you are compliant with something. You have to prove it. And in this sense, what Miguel was saying is very important because training uh, is not only a question of, of having uh, 100 or 200 percent people uh, 200 people, sorry, 100% trained. The point is to let them know what is the clear responsibility they have. So in the, in the supply chain for a, a pharmaceutical buyer, the point is to have clear their responsibilities, to know exactly at the end of a point what's going on before, what is going on in the next step. So this is the point. So training represents for people an opportunity. And of course, you have to have an internal organization Let's say I'm very severe on that because I strongly believe in that. You cannot say uh, once again, I'm the best. You have to prove it. So you cannot say I can uh, um, handle pharmaceutical if you don't have a department referred to pharmaceutical dedicated on that. And when they work with the commercial for pharmaceutical, operation for pharmaceutical, compliance for pharmaceutical, then they have clear responsibilities, each of them. This is my, this is my personal view. Yeah, no, 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 I agree with you because it's all about that care culture. Um, that's something that you can't have written down on, on manuals or certification. And when people see it, it's so important. And, and again, just, just from experience, I've also seen, you know, the, the cost pressures now on this very sensitive market segment that we're, we're talking about. Because, you know, I've seen pharma that everybody knows is pharma, but it comes in incorrectly labeled, incorrectly you know, uh, outlines and, and it's, it's wrong, you know, and anybody who does things incorrectly with such an important, um, you know, product that affects people, the, the repercussions from the regulators should be a lot, lot stronger. Absolutely, yes. 
And uh, but please, Chiara, I, I leave the, I leave the, the the word to Chiara. Otherwise, they talk a lot. Bye, Chiara. Well, well simply, I wanted to say um, it was definitely not an easy shipment, but it was really coming together that made the difference. Because exactly as you just said, Chris, Qatar could have say, guys. I'm only responsible from my pencils to Chicago. They yeah. could have clearly said that, but no, I think they were there with us, uh, you know, uh, looking at the lane, find solution. That's really nice when we come together in that way, because yes, I mean, as a packaging provider, probably I'm the one that follows the shipment door to door the most, uh, but to have partners that also cares of what's happening before the container is delivered to them and after, it, it makes our life easier. I mean, I, I, I hate when I hear some people saying, well, the INCO terms are CIP, so once I arrive at the airport, it's not my responsibility. And I work with pharmaceutical company. They invest so much to have a spot on cool chain until mm -hmm. arrival at destination airport. Then when it arrives at destination airport, goes not what happens to this pharmaceutical product. So it can well be increased that a lot of the excursion up happen after that point. So it is a shame to see also pharmaceutical company investing so much upstream. But yep. then the last mile is like, Nobody cares. So it is really important that uh, that we came together here. We deliver, I think, a, a, a top performance for this customer of ours. And um, that should be the way forward. Yes. Yeah, no, 100%. And it, it shows that, you know, you're not like individual 100 meter sprinters. You're a relay team and you have to pass the baton on to give the next runner the chance to, you know, do what's necessary for the team. That, and that's what's so important now. And I think the more people, the more people feel that their organizations and their companies are actually contributing to that culture, the more enjoyable it is for them to be part of that particular company. And if their companies explain to them why, what helps you, an acronym I always use for the word why, if people know why, then they can accept certain demands or certain pressures on what they're expected to do, because they really do genuinely know why. I totally agree, and that's uh, coming back to my previous comment. It's important that everyone is is, is aware and growing the same direction. So that's that's absolutely critical. And and uh, and uh, continue with Chiara's uh, words. I mean, I could not imagine uh, saying anything like that, or any of my colleagues saying anything like that. Uh, that that's a big no no uh, for us. We we definitely care. Uh, what happens before and after? It, it's as important as uh, what happens during our care. Right? It, it affects the shipment at the end of the day. Uh, you cannot exclude yourself from the equation or say, okay, it's already at the at destination. That's it, bye-bye. Uh, um, that, that's not possible. We need to keep working together with a uh, with, uh, forwarder, with a uh, container supplier in this case, with a consignee, with the authorities. We need to make sure that uh, that product is delivered as uh, it was expected. We, we cannot just wash our hands uh, the moment that uh, shipment touch, uh, touches destination. That's, that's not possible. Exactly, because we are all part of this one supply chain. And the one thing that this crisis has, has given us is that awareness that we have to come together and it's and it's refreshing. And, you know, long may that last, that care culture. Now, guys, can I ask you, I'm just, I'd just like to ask a question of you. And um, we've actually done this of, of most of the panels. And the question, the question that I'm going to ask you, and I hope, I hope you don't mind, is the following. It is, let me just find it here now, because I wrote it down the other day. If you just bear me one second. The question is, if you were given the chance, okay, as individuals to wave a magic wand and say, you know, what would you like to see happen within the supply chain teamwork and collaboration platform? within the next six to nine months to make a huge impact on the business. What now would you think are the most crucial or important elements? And I, you know, I, I know I've just sprung it on you. So if you need a couple of minutes to, uh, to think about it, I can, uh, I can sing or dance or whatever, but I'm pretty sure that one of you will jump up front and then the rest of you will follow very quickly. So if you had a magic wand and it was gonna make a huge impact on the industry and the business, what would you like to see? I'm going to share it from Fabrizio. I'm going to steal it, Fabrizio, but it's data sharing. Yeah. Transparency, visibility. 
yeah uh, and 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 risk management and uh preparation i mean we we take it for granted that uh, everyone knows what to do from a to b sometimes uh, yeah. but uh, when we talk about these particular projects um i think that's pre-work and uh, risk assessment uh, it's 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 something that needs to be done uh, it's it needs to be embedded on everyone's uh, um on everyone's behavior so uh, yeah definitely the data sharing is important but uh, also the the land risk assessment or the risk assessment in general that comes with it uh, it's crucial yeah 100 percent uh, uh, bridge yo yes i may i completely agree with uh, my colleagues i would simply add competence uh training uh, and uh, I want to be really hard on that in the sense that uh, or in or out of the game, we need to raise the bar on that or in or out. No other ways. Yeah, very good. Very good. Just like those two central defenders in your national team, my friend. Hey, no <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, uncompromising. Beautiful. Listen, guys, thank you so, so much for your time. It's really appreciated. And like I said at the beginning, if, if, if I was there or we were at a face to face, this is now where I'd say to everybody, please, you know, please stand up and, and uh, you know, and, and give a round of applause to people that have really made a difference, not just in our industry, but also, you know, for everybody else globally by setting an example. Long may this continue. And I think it's the best way forward, you know, people sharing, being a lot more open than ever they were before. And that's the only way to win any game. So thank you all so, so much for your time, your effort and your expertise and professionalism. It's really appreciated. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank Grazie. you, Chris. Grazie. Thanks Grazie. a lot. Grazie. Adios. Ciao. <laughs>